So, uh, yeah, thanks for quick introduction. Uh, another quick introduction, so who I am and why you should be listening to me. Uh, so I'm from Kyiv, Ukraine originally. Uh, I've been using Python since 2001, uh, writing code professionally since 2002. I uh, worked a lot on visual effects, uh, then uh, did an MBA, then somehow transitioned to data science, like some of you here. Data science, of course, is a new field. Um, so currently I'm uh, heading a data science team at a mobile gaming company, Vuga. So, how many of you are using Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, cool, well, that's kind of obvious, otherwise you probably wouldn't be at this talk. Um, and in my experience, I've seen a lot of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so before uh, coming to Berlin and leading this data science team at Wuga, I was leading another data science team at another mobile gaming company in London, and I've seen some really horrible looking uh, Python Notebooks. Uh, to be honest, half of them were my own notebooks. Um, so. How did we get here and why it's important and what we can do about it? That's actually the topics of this talk. Why we end up with a Py uh, messy Python notebooks? Well, partially it's because this mag magical beast, a data scientist, is a combination of part-time engineer, a scientist, and maybe a business person. Um, so we are not, some of us, a lot of uh, people in data science are not coming from software engineering background, of course. And that's great. That's what makes this community so unique and so diverse. But it also um, creates some problems. Another problem uh, with data science community is it's so new. So when I was uh, looking at some uh, books on data science, for instance, um, this is a quarter from a data science in Python book. In a nutshell, coding is telling a computer to do something using a language it understands. So that's a level where some of those introductory data science books are at. It's really targeting people who just have no clue and try to figure out how to, how to use this code thing. Uh, another part of the problem is currently the number of data scientists is probably doubling every two or three years, I'd say, which means that at any point in time, half of the data scientists are, have less than two or three years of work experience overall. And that's, of course, also a challenge. Yesterday, I was in this room, and uh, somebody made a comment that generally data scientists don't really write a good code, uh, not as good as data engineers. I actually want to say that I disagree with that. Controlling for years of work experience, I hope that it actually it's not the case, because actually data scientists are focused on doing a specific thing. Uh, they're probably more focused on actually doing that thing and don't have as much time thinking about abstractions and building some more complex things and uh, then worry too much about some of those things that make a code completely uh, unreadable if you actually don't have a lot of experience. So I read a quote somewhere that uh, a typical software engineer masters complexity for the first two years of his or her career, and then the next 20 years uh, spends mastering uh, art of simplicity. So first you get super excited about object orientation, so you write classes everywhere. Then you discover functional programmer programming, you switch everything to functions. Then you discover decorators, you start decorating everything. Then you discover metaprogramming, so you write code that will generate another code, or maybe you start inventing a language, so you don't actually need to write a programming code, you can define everything using some higher level of abstraction. And then, after five, maybe 10 years, you figure out that actually there's only three operators in programming. It's assignment, it's if statement, and it's a loop. And everything else you just kind of put on top to make those three basic constructs more manageable. So anyway, um, another reason why we end up with the messy Jupyter notebooks is because the typical answer is that it's not going to production anyway. I'm just playing around, I'm just doing research. Therefore, who cares that my code is messy? And that's fundamentally wrong, I believe. Because any fool can write code that computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Um, Kent Beck said that. And uh, that's, of course, very true for Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are written not from computer to consume, but actually for other people to read and understand. So, in my opinion, it's arguably even more important to clean your uh, code clean inside a Jupyter Notebook than in some software systems. Uh, and then, of course, like you write something messy, it works, so you don't care. But then, of course, it doesn't end there. There's always follow-up questions, and then you start uh, drilling deeper into data, and then a product manager or whoever, or maybe a supervisor comes and with tons more questions. So you actually have to reuse your code multiple times. So keeping your code clean, of course, is super important. So 
Hopefully I convinced you that actually uh, keeping your notebook in a Jupyter messy is not a good thing, and even so it doesn't go to production maybe, somehow or sometimes it does. Uh, we still need to write code that is, is clean. So first uh, community that we can borrow a lot of knowledge from is of course a software engineering community. Those guys were thinking about how to write clean code for decades. Uh, specifically, Robert C. Martin, uh, also known as Uncle Bob, uh, popularized uh, the clean code movement and uh, thought a lot about how to do that. So first of all, what is clean code? Before we figure out how to write clean code, let's think about what actually is a clean code. Pleasantly graceful and stylish in appearance or manner. Wow. And that's a guy who actually invented C++. Oh my god. Clean code reads like a well-written prose. Hmm, that actually sounds pretty cool. Each routine turns out to be pretty much what you expected. So it's uh, the surprise minimization thing. I think it's actually, it resonates well with me. But how do you actually do it? There are also some advices how to do it on a high level, on some philosophical level. I like this one. Uh, first make it work, then make it right, then make it fast and small. Run all tests, contain no duplicate code, express all ideas, minimizes classes and methods. And this one by Uncle Bob Martin. Basically, general rule is you try to leave the uh, campground cleaner than you found it. It's actually applied from Boy Scout rules of America, apparently, but it actually applies very well to code. So every time you try to improve the code once you read somebody else's code and you're visiting it, you always can find that a uh, few things how to refactor it. Of course, to refactor code, you need tests, and that's also... Uh, one of the reasons why we have a lot of ugly code. Uh, also, Kant Beck said that I'm not a great programmer, I'm just a good programmer with great habits. So, how do we actually can develop uh, those better habits? What we can do to develop those habits? Um, let's first talk about uh, naming things. As uh, Phil Carlton uh, said, uh, it's a famous saying, there are only two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. And uh, from my experience, cache invalidation is actually not too hard, but naming things, of course, is. A uh, couple of years ago, when I was doing my MBA and uh, I did all sorts of businessy classes and I really missed uh, coding, I uh, started programming in Objective-C. And uh, in the beginning, it was pretty horrible. The learning curve was quite steep. I don't know, whoever kind of touched Objective-C in some shape and form, a couple of people. So. It's, when you look at it, it looks pretty horrible, but after a while I really start appreciating it. Uh, and then I found that language is very beautiful. It's super ver verbose, uh, so they really like really long descriptive names. I actually learned how to write a good Python code by uh, learning Objective-C uh, more so than um, maybe for the last five years when I was just using Python. So uh, in Python modules, quite a lot uh, you will find that there are very short names. It's like tendency to make everything very small and sometimes actually hurts us. So long descriptive names, try to find name for variables and functions that are, you can actually pronounce and you can also search in a code. Avoid encoding, add meaningful context and basically don't be lazy. So when you find something that doesn't, is not named properly, just rename it. Uh, for that, of course, you need to use a good ID that, can, uh, that has refactoring functions. So you can rename it once and then you don't worry that it will break in 10 other places. So that's naming. Uh, then uh, functions. Function is a basic building block of most programming uh, languages, most, most things. And um, those guys who thought hard about uh, clean code, uh, their rule of thumb is that the function should be maximum five lines long. And for some people, it actually sounds quite crazy. Five lines, it's just too small, so how do you actually manage it? Uh, but quite often, that's actually a very good thing. So maybe 10 in some circumstances. Three is even better. So by putting small bits of code in function, then naming, it, naming the function can really help improve readability as well as maintainability and modularity. Then comments. Sure. Sure. Uh, yes. So the question was, uh, what is it? Yep. Uh, what does it mean have one level of abstraction? Um, so the same f uh, function, it's bad if it has, for instance, database connection layers as well as uh, stats models applied to it. You're kind of mixing the two. So, but this is a very kind of high level. So what is a right level of abstraction? Of course, is context specific. 
but if you start thinking, oh, is there actually separate layers or is it two different things, then most likely you can separate it into multiple functions, into two functions. Also, some people are saying that uh, you should not be passing arguments to a function that controls some if statements. So like Boolean, Boolean arguments, that's also a code smell. In Python, however, it, it depends. There are a lot of uh, situations in Python where actually it does make sense because uh, those advices also were written uh, by people who mostly use Java and C++. But I will be covering Python-specific clean code practices in a, in a later section. So right now we are covering just the basics of uh, the clean code uh, as it was presented and written by um, Uncle Bob uh, and other people. So uh, another one is about comments. And uh, basically, when you feel the need to write a comment, first try to refactor the code so that any comment becomes irrelevant. Um, generally, you should feel sorry every time you write a comment. If you write a comment, you're admitting that you can't write a code that people can read and understand. There are circumstances, uh, there are uh, exceptions, of course. So if um, you actually found that there is a specific bug in a library and you need to hack around it and then you're doing something quite unobvious, in this uh, special case, yeah, you probably should write a comment so that the next person would not try to just refactor it and use a uh, functionality that's supposed to work. Because, well, you trust to try it and it doesn't work. Or if the algorithm is very complex and you actually do feel that you need to uh, explain it. But in most circumstances, comments is a, is a code smell and you should try to get rid of them effectively. When I wrote this, only God and I understood what I was doing. Now, God only knows. It's one of the good comments. Let's look at more examples. Sometimes I believe my compiler ignores all my comments. Yeah, that's, that's true. I also feel the same. Oh, that's the best one. So yeah, yeah sometimes you change the code, but quite often you forget to change comments. So those comments can be there lying around and then just be misleading. Uh, so how to get there? Well, lots of resources out there. There are lots of good books written on the subject by people much smarter than I uh, myself and who thought a lot about it. Also, code conventions is important in any uh, organization. And uh, as soon as uh, the fastest your team will arrive to some code convention and try to follow it, the better you'll uh, be in the long run. So, uh, and the team conventions uh, are more important than language conventions or uh, your personal conventions, of course. So, that was a generic clean code things. Uh, let's uh, move specifically to Python. And Python is, of course, not Java, C++, so uh, there are differences. First of all is code convention, code style. Um, how many of you know PEP8? Well, most people do, that's great. Uh, for those of you who don't, definitely check it out. Uh, it might be al already outdated a bit, uh, but generally it's, it's still very relevant. Another good resource for a uh, style guide that you can just adapt in your organization and don't uh, argue too much about it is, of course, adapting a Google style guide. So they have uh, conventions about naming and about uh, uh, all sorts of things. And there are books written specifically on how to write clean code in Python. So my favorite one is a Fluent Python, but there are some other uh, ones as well. Because, yes, Python is not Java, and there are a few things that... Uh, so design patterns, for instance, in Python, um, you can't just apply uh, Java design patterns and hope the, your Python code to, to be nicely written, because it's, it's not. Okay, so Jupyter Notebooks. It's a PyData conference, uh, so most of you are using Jupyter. Most of you are doing some sort of data science, or maybe more on the science side of things. Um, so how to apply those principles? Are those principles applicable inside Jupyter Notebooks? Well, of course they are, but there are also differences. So a typical organization of a notebook is you import your stuff, then you get your data, then you do something to your data, then you maybe do some modeling, visualizations, and then concluding things. And this is kind of a general pattern in a lot of data science notebooks. I don't want to say all of the data science notebooks, but a lot of them follow some sort of this uh, pattern. Uh, and as a community, uh, so the Jupyter Notebook and overall uh, coding in Notebook is relatively new format. So there is not that many resources available, not that many best practices are available on how to organize a research project. So uh, 
Actually, one of the origins of this talk is a Stack Overflow question, uh, as a lot of those talks uh, start. And somebody asked the question, how to organize um, a Python uh, notebook project when you have few collaborators, few, few scientists working together on a project, how to organize it? So first the question that I would like to um, ask, not really answer, is how, should, how big should a notebook file will be? So we're here in Berlin, PyData conference, a um, bunch of data scientists, and we should be leading this uh, thinking, and I would like to ask uh, your thoughts as well. So in my experience, uh, one notebook file, uh, which should, should only, um, you should try to keep your notebook files small. So one notebook file per major hypothesis. You have an idea, you test in one notebook. If you have multiple ideas, it's better to split them in different notebooks. So you have a hypothesis, you get some data, you uh, understand the data, you explore the data, and you uh, either confirm the hypothesis or uh, deny the hypothesis. So I'm, in my experience, I like to keep my notebook small. I'd say four, maybe 10 cells uh, long. If it's more than 10 cells, normally, most often than not, it's very hard to follow, it's very hard to read. So uh, computer programmers, software engineers, has been doing that for decades. They were splitting their long uh, source files into smaller files. And I think as a data scientist, we should actually uh, adopt those practices because they are as uh, relevant for us as for a software engineering community. So split your notebooks. Uh, how to split the notebooks? There are multiple uh, ways to do it, uh, but that's kind of one idea. Uh, if you're doing a lot of data processing, just move it into a separate notebook. They're just doing only data processing and wrangling where you combine your data, you're cleaning your data, maybe even splitting it further. And then in notebooks where you're actually analyzing the data, where you're building some models, uh, probably should be a separate notebook. Uh, so the second tip uh, that uh, is and we arrived there organically, is uh, there are a lot of repetitions, and uh, you kind of start seeing that people are copy-pasting code from one notebook to another. It could be your data connection uh, function, so you always uh, establish a connection to your SQL database or to whatever data you have there. Uh, there's also uh, some publishing functions that are quite common in organizations. So uh, we normally uh, work with slides, with Google Slides, effectively, and uh, the publishing library that generates slides, it's one of the perfect examples of what you can put in your shared library. But also database connections, your visualization libraries, uh, some other things that are common, but that are no sp not specific to the problem at hand, of course. So if you're not doing that in your organization, start doing that early and then you can reuse and you can really clean up your notebooks so that your notebooks will be just about the code and uh, about your research, not about uh, those utility stupid things that you just copy past. Um, secondly, actually, IPython notebooks is not just Python, there, it is specific, it's kind of, it's, it's a different beast. Um, so don't put your magic source of a notebook in, into uh, different files. So uh, if you're fitting a model or you're building analysis, that part of the stuff should not uh, go into utils library. Uh, because uh, when people are opening your notebook, they expect to see uh, that's what they uh, want to see. They want to see the model. They want to see how you're actually analyzing the data. And if when they open your notebook and they just find um, that you're using a function that you put in some Python files that you're just importing, well, they then have to go into this file and try to figure out what's in this file, and then it's much harder to reproduce. So the secret sauce, don't put in, a, uh, in your utils library. Sure. Yes, so um, for instance, the plotting functions, um, I kind of, sometimes you have a multidimensional um, data, multidimensional time series in our uh, context. And quite often you look at different uh, variables, you're slicing and dicing, and those things, yeah, you probably should put them in a the function, but uh, the secret sauce is probably better to keep in uh, in notebook. So if you're fitting a model, I probably rather put, put it in notebook. Also, generally, uh, duplication is better than wrong abstraction. And quite often, we as an engineer, uh, at least those of us who feel that, uh, the urge to engineer, sometimes we, we want to abstract. We want to find those commonalities and we, oh, actually I can uh, put it in a function, in a class, because it's, I'm actually doing almost the same things. And then you figure out that actually I need to add those special cases for this model. And then you start adding those Boolean um, arguments to your functions so that it can cover different cases. But generally, 
first make it work, then make it right, and then only make it beautiful and small. And duplication is quite often better than wrong abstraction. Yeah, clean code reads like a well-written prose. And yeah, let's uh, aim for Jupyter Notebooks to be, uh, to be read like a well-written prose. So the second question is, how big a cell should be? A cell is a fundamental building block in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and I argue that each shell, each cell should have one output. So what makes a notebook and uh, cells unique is that you write your code and then you see an output of whatever you just did. So if you have multiple outputs for cell, probably it's not a good idea. Of course there are exceptions, but basically one cell is, I have an idea, I execute and I see an output, and that's it. So that a uh, person who is reading, reading your notebook can much easier follow uh, your line of thought. So if you have multiple outputs, it can be harder to read. Um, then another tip is uh, coming from a test-driven development and also just writing tests. You can write uh, tests in Python notebooks, and uh, there is a great um, plugin for PyTest. PyTest is a unit test runner uh, for Python, one of the main ones, and there is a plugin that allows you to, that will find uh, tests inside your notebooks. So you need to uh, name your notebooks tests underscore, and then a PyTest runner will find them, will execute them, and then will report errors later. So for instance, when you're working on the shared library uh, that is used across organization, you can actually write tests inside notebooks because uh, a lot of those functions will be executed in a notebook environment. So why write unit tests not in a notebook environment? If you write unit tests in a notebook environment, it also would be easier for other people to uh, read those notebooks and then uh, see what your functions are supposed to do within the outputs and everything. Um, another thing, what we found, uh, so normally when an organization just start adopting Jupyter Notebooks, uh, quite often it starts from the ground up. So normally it's data scientists, some of them are kind of playing with Python, some of them may be playing with R, and then those who are using Python start probably putting Anaconda on their local machines. As soon as you create a shared uh, Jupyter server, uh, the sooner you'll get a uh, code that you can reproduce, uh, you can share, and you can really collaborate on it. It's super important. Uh, so we, of course, started there. Everybody has their own Anaconda environment, and then you fighting uh, the difference in libraries. Oh, I'm using Pandas version this, and then I can't read your pickle in my new Pandas because I just upgraded Anaconda. Also, uh, while you might have your shared library, it's much harder to um, make changes to the shared library and also uh, deploy those shared library. If it's on the server, you make a change, you deploy, everybody is using it. Otherwise, everybody has their own versions of your shared library, and then you need to, oh, have you updated a shared library? Do you know that we actually updated it? No, I haven't because I'm too busy, right? So the sooner you get a shared uh, server, uh, the better, and the sooner you get to uh, reproducible uh, results that are easier to read. Um, I'd like to talk about a few code smells that uh, we discovered uh, in kind of our experience. Uh, the first code smell in a Jupyter Notebook, the, the worst one, and that's what makes uh, Jupyter Notebooks actually pretty bad. Some people are going as far as saying that's a horrible format and we should not actually be using notebooks, is uh, you, if you're not careful, you can make a notebook unreproducible, right? You can execute cells in whatever order, and then it can change a state uh, in different places. And unfortunately, as far as I know, even right now in the latest uh, Jupyter uh, version, um, restart and run all, it's still a menu item, it's not a button on, on a on a tooltip. You can actually put it and you can make a shortcut, uh, but basically um, try to make sure that you, at any point in time in your research, in your analysis, you can hit restart and run all and you get to the same results. Uh, to get there, uh, you probably need to work on the caching layer, especially if it takes some time to load the data or manipulate the data. So uh, in our caching library, um, the cache is automatically created every time you connect a database and you extract some data. So rerunning the whole notebook should be fast. And uh, for that, you need to invest in your shared tools. So you can actually rerun a notebook and it's fast. Of course, sometimes it's not possible. If you're doing a Markov chain Monte Carlo and it takes whatever, half an hour to converge, yeah, good luck with that. Um, also, uh, it, you can kind of mix your ideas, prototypes, and your Clean, uh, clean results and uh, clean after yourself, basically. You, you 
play it with a code, you reach somewhere, uh, delete those cells, or make a copy of a notebook before you start prototyping. So you keep your main notebook, the one that you're actually working on, and if you have this exploratory idea, make a duplicate and work in a duplicate copy so you don't end up with some prototyping cells mixing uh, together with your output cells. Um, slightly experimental idea, but actually yesterday it was mentioned already. Uh, a pattern that is emerging and uh, we actually find it quite useful is a pattern when you run a notebook from another notebook. So quite often uh, you work on a, on a notebook, you have an analysis, and the typical way to rerun it is of course to wrap it in a function or maybe in a class, because if your function is too big you probably want to break it into classes. But then you actually break in the whole Jupyter environment. If you take the whole research and try to put it in a function, then it would be harder to reproduce, it would be harder to read for other data scientists. Uh, you are losing this uh, idea execution output format that cells provide. Uh, and as an idea, what you can do, you can actually put all the main uh, parameters, uh, main arguments for a notebook into the first cell in a notebook, and then run one notebook from another notebook. We found it useful. Uh, it's still somewhat uh, experimental feature, but um, quite often you actually want to do that. You don't want to copy-paste everything into a function. You just want to run the same analysis, but with a different set of inputs, different dates, different user segment, whatever it is. And there apparently, yesterday I've heard that there's a GitHub project that's already uh, doing that, uh, but um, here I'm presenting a snippet of code that also works. That's what we use. And then, uh, uh, you can actually take this idea one step forward and then make a product directly from your notebook. So if you can run a notebook from another notebook and then pass parameters, then actually in this other notebook you can put a simple UI using a brilliant IPy widgets library and then effectively uh, turn your notebook into a product. And then with the Jupyter dashboards, it's actually you can push it one step forward and uh, you can easily share this with, within your organization. And kind of what we're reaching with the solution is actually we are right now building products. We're not just playing around with research, we're actually building products. And I believe that that's what data scientists are supposed to do. That's what actually differentiates data scientists from data analysts, effectively. We're supposed to make our uh, research and knowledge easily shareable and easily reproducible and ultimately empowering everyone to, to use data and to understand data. So, in a summary. Sir? With version control. Uh, so version control in Jupyter Notebooks is not a completely solved problem. Uh, there are a few uh, ways to do it. Uh, so what we do, we do check the code uh, to GitHub, uh, but um, so you, you push uh, the content of the folder to a GitHub, but uh, it's actually in a separate folder. So uh, our GitHub repository is n doesn't live on the same level where all the notebooks are. Um, it's actually separate, so, uh, and then we have a copy everything to a Git uh, repository, uh, create a new branch, and then uh, push this branch. So that's how we deal with it, so everything is uh, on a GitHub. Yes? So we don't do pre-processing on top of notebooks. I know there are some projects that try to just you know, strip everything that's not a code, so you can do divs and uh, everything like that. Uh, we're not there yet, or kind of we didn't really feel that much need to maybe do that, because actually it's also great when you can go to GitHub, open a notebook, and then you see the output as well. So if you strip out all your output, all the metadata, then inside GitHub, when you look at it, it's just, just cells, so then it's you know, harder to read. Um, so yeah, um, notebooks, keep them small, uh, make, your, uh, make your utils library. Uh, good Jupyter notebooks should read like a well-written prose. Each cell should have one and only one output. Write tests, deploy a shared Jupyter server, try to uh, keep code inside notebooks, uh, avoid refactoring to modules if possible. But of course, if it's your scientific code, not a utility code. And that's pretty much it. So right now, yeah, I'd like to discuss it with you. Yeah.
questions and if you're if you're reachable by mic that would be great if uh, you may be able to so that would be better but otherwise I can just repeat your question, yes, so you just... So the question was about best practices to train deep learning um, uh, networks. This talk about Jupyter Notebooks, not really about deep learning, so I'm sorry, but not really. <laughs> But yeah, you can of course use, I think, like most examples about deep learning, they are actually in a notebook format. Why notebook format is specific to, why, why like deep learning is a special case. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what we actually do. So. We, Oh, uh, so um, the remark was, w was it better to uh, deploy a GPU server with a notebook, uh, with a Jupyter um, on the GPU server, and then uh, have people access to it? So, and that's actually what, what we did. So uh, we created an EC2 instance that you can, normally it's shut down because, you know, GPU instances are not cheap, and normally we don't actually need GPU instance, but if you do, you go to EC2, you resurrect it, so it's running, and then you connect to Jupyter uh, on the GPU instance, and then you can use a GPU instance, and then you stop it. So that you stop paying. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, thank you for the talk. I totally agree with pretty much everything you said, except point 0.7. I really think you should keep almost all implementation out of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, because then if I read someone else's Jupyter Notebook, I have to go through all the implementation of, of everything, which I don't care about. As long as the function has a name that I understand, I know what's happening. Um, but yeah, my question is, uh, I really like the uh, UI builder uh, thing that you've shown. I've, I haven't seen that before. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on how you use it and if there's maybe a way to hide the cells? Because I feel like for non-technical people, mm. that's very intimidating if you have all the code in there as well. <laughs> So, um, the question, oh, actually, there was a microphone, yeah. Uh, so, the UI is, of course, built using IPython widgets, a well-known library. It's great. Uh, so, uh, how to hide code and how to make it kind of more presentable and more, um, <coughs> excuse me, and user-friendly. Um, we started by injecting a small um, JavaScript snippet that would just hide the cells. That was version one, quite ugly implementation. And then the problem, of course, is that uh, somebody will still open your notebook and it's kind of one instance. So if two users start using your notebook, they, of course, start stepping on each other's um, toes and it's not good. Um, uh, but there is a great project called Jupyter Dashboards that uh, makes uh, deploying uh, applications from Jupyter Notebook as simple as just clicking on a UI item and then selecting deploy as, as a web application. Uh, and what it does, it copies your uh, Python notebook file to normally to a different container, and then uh, people would connect to that, and then there is a kernel manager that would uh, create new kernels every time the user would, uh, would connect to it. Uh, so that's, of course, superior um, solution because it's a proper web app, there's no cell, so you don't also don't worry that somebody will actually mess around with your notebook. Thank you. Who else has questions? Just so I can spread them equally around the room, not just near me. Uh, okay, let's go to someone there and then we'll come back here. Anyone else in the room? Uh, just a quick follow-up. You can actually in the dashboard server like rearrange all your widgets and stuff. Like you have a layouting engine, which is like very very nice, uh, and you can get rid of the code, and it looks really cool. Like it's it's so much better than just like writing a web app on top of your analysis. Yeah. Um, then another point. There's like a cool uh, cookie cutter project, uh, the data science cookie cutter project, which gives you like a nice folder structures for your IPython notebook. So you have a make file which downloads all the files that you need and stuff, and it makes everything like more reproducible. Uh, just check that out. It's a great tool. Um, I forgot my actual question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one. Uh, have you looked into Zeppelin notebooks and like did you compare them versus IPython notebooks? Uh, not seriously. So we considered them for SQL only. 
because you can just write SQL without any Python code and then plot it without any uh, plotting code. So for that reason, we looked at it. Okay, just before people start leaving the room, I want to make a final remark. Uh, if you haven't learned anything from this presentation because everything was obvious to you and you're kind of doing it already, I really want to talk to you because Wuga is hiring. If you have uh, listened to this talk and you learned something and actually you want to do more of that, then I want to talk to you because Wuga is hiring. If you listened to this presentation and didn't learn anything because you're not interested in that, then Wuga is still hiring, but maybe I'm not so interested talking to you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, when uh, do you see that Jupyter Notebooks are not good to be used? I'm sorry? When we should not use Jupyter Notebooks? When you should not use? Yeah. Do uh, you see any case where... Yeah, of course. Well, I think if you're working on a um, complex application with multiple you know, uh, dependencies, uh, I would much prefer to work inside a PyCharm environment. That's the idea of my choice. And you know, if you're an Emacs user or Vim user, it's kind of up to you. But I like uh, to work inside IDE. And at this point, uh, Jupyter IDE is definitely far from perfect. So only a couple of, I think, less than two years ago, uh, they introduced uh, search and replace all functionality. Before that, you couldn't even do that. And there is no refactoring functionality in Jupyter Notebooks. So you can't just you know, uh, properly uh, rename the variable or class uh, and have a renamer that is context savvy, context specific, and understands that you don't just want to do a dummy search and replace, but you actually replace the variable. There is no refactoring functions to uh, extract a parts of the function or a methods into a subfunction. So um, I would always prefer to work inside PyCharm uh, with code uh, compared to notebooks. But from the other hand, I really like that you can run a bit of code and then you see an output and then you can move on and you do that. And that, I think that's super fast. It's super reproducible. And, yeah. We have time for one or two more questions. Who still has questions? OK. Anyone? No? One, two. Perfect. Uh, thanks for the talk, uh, very interesting. And I actually learned something that is calling a notebook from another notebook. But I would like to know if you have any example where this is useful. Sure. So, uh, for instance, um, we do a lot of um, cohorts analysis, so user behavior analysis. So we might be looking at how users in a specific game who installed a game uh, in uh, January this year behaved since since today, basically, how their uh, user journey evolved. And you, you work on the results, and it's all fine. And then um, you, you want to actually, maybe, maybe you want to look at a different cohort, and uh, then you can run the whole analysis with all the steps, all your visualizations, all the modeling, but just on different cohort of users, or on a different game. So that's, that's an example. Uh, I actually think it's out of time. Uh, we're out of time. Let's take the, let's take the final question offline. Oh, you can you can ask, but we'll get set back. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's kind of quick. Yeah. Um, so um, for the, the the basically Jupyter and Cloud, I was using that with colleagues, and we ran into problems because uh, basically when two people work on the same notebook, it's not gonna really work out. What is the best practice there? Uh, it can be a problem. So the alternative is to actually have a dedicated uh, Docker containers for environments. Uh, I'm actually against that. Uh, I think that it's not too hard to develop some sort of a convention. Of if you're opening a notebook that is already running, because when you open, you can see a, a green icon. It means that somebody is working on it. So you duplicate a notebook, and then you kind of, if you think that you will actually do something, that's of course quite ugly and you know duplication. Uh. However, normally it works and. Uh, actually, if you keep your notebook small, that uh, to a large degree solves this problem. Because um, the reason why you want to work on the same notebook if you're working on the same uh, research, but probably you can split it into some smaller notebooks, and therefore you wouldn't be really stepping on each other's toes. So keep your notebook small and don't overcomplicate things. And it's, it works. Uh, thank you very, very much. James was not lying. <laughs> uh, thank you.